So I want to talk about flying for records. It's really, it's another dimension to our sport. You can, you know, great things about the sport. You can um, enjoy cross-country flying, enjoy wave flying, which is what Frank was just talking about. Um, uh, if uh, you like, you can go fly competitions, do long distance flying, or you can go for records, or all the above. Um, so there's a lot of dimensions to it. So I'm, uh, I've got written on the records myself, uh, both Australian records and continental records, or a continental record. Um, I'd dearly love to see some other South Australian pilots that are sort of chasing those as well. Uh, we could have some competition there. I spend most of my time in competition flying as well, but so obviously there's a, some of the skills are the same. Um, I'll talk about some of the differences as we, as we go through this. So uh, hopefully it's interesting to you. I don't have any prepared slides, so um, there's no death by PowerPoint or anything like that. Um, I'll just be, um, uh, be sort of getting ideas on things and putting some things up on there and actually running through a couple of flights as well as examples. Um, so, so it's going to write up on here. Let's do that. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a few things. So you've got preparation. Let's spell that right. Yeah. Um, the task itself. Um, I'll do it for a moment. I'll write some more down there. Now, in terms of preparation, when it comes to record flying, when might you actually start? If you want to, can I get a record? Book? Where's a good place to, to start in preparation? Mm. Yourself. Yeah. Well, there's preparation of yourself. Um, but even before you do that, we'll perhaps have a look at what records are actually out there. Um, what it is, what are the achievements of other pilots? What are you actually trying to aspire to surpass? So of course, to get a record, you've got to get a previous record. So, um, that's which record? What records? I'll show you. If you go to the GFA website, I just have to turn some internet on. Oh, you just you got logs. Uh, it's probably easy just to put a hotspot on here. So that's the GFA website, which hopefully you've all seen before. If you go to Member Services, Badges and Records, you'll find a whole bunch of information. If I scroll up and down there, you'll see all sorts of stuff that talks about badges and records. Now, it's not particularly well formatted, but all the information is actually there, so at least it's in one place. So if you want to look at records, um, like the Australian records, on records there, uh, Records Australia. Now there are, as I've mentioned before, there are different categories of records. So there's Australian records, um, Australian national records, so which are done by Australian pilots in Australia. There are Australian records which are done by Australian pilots anywhere, like overseas. So people that go fly away in Argentina or something like that, or up in the ridges in the USA, those sorts of things. Um, there are continental records, which in our area is the Oceania region, which is a subcategory of a world record, and then there are world records. Um, I hate to tell you this, but the easy world records have been taken, so <laughs> it's really hard to get one of those. But when you go through, when I look at some of these Australian records here, you'll see that um, some of these are actually not so unachievable. So if you look here, these are the open class records in Australia. Um, okay, there's a whole bunch up here at um, 1,300 kilometres and things like that. Um, out and return 1,000 kilometres, starting to get up to 138 kilometres an hour. I think that's quite achievable. So certainly in the 20, uh, G29 or something like that. Um, uh, I've got an eye on this one. <laughs> out and return 1,250 kilometres. I can assure you from Gawler that goes a long way north. It's part of the Birdsville track. Um, but I'm planning that one. 
Um, interestingly, this 195 kilometres an hour seems like an astronomically high speed, but I'm going to go into that a little bit in terms of that. That's a triangle. And that, okay, it was done in 1982, which gives you some idea of that, um, uh, is something that I reckon is quite achievable with modern gliders. And I'll go into the reasons why that is. Um, so even in the open class, there are, uh, on the other triangular, um, 1,000 kilometres, 135 kilometres an hour. Um, the problem with the really big flights is that generally, particularly at the beginning of the day, to some extent at the end of the day, your speeds are going to be quite slow. Um, so, although, yeah, to do 135 kilometres an hour around the peak of the day is not an issue, to try and do that over eight hours is an issue because the first hour or two generally is pretty slow. So they're the open class records, um, which are uh, the Australian ones. If you go to 15 metre class, these start to get a bit easier. Um, I guess one of the things I'm trying to point out here with the low hanging fruit, you can pick some of these in here that are actually pretty easy to beat. And I shouldn't point out this one, but 117 kilometres an hour, out and return 1,000 kilometres. I shouldn't point it out because I can't hold that one, but I don't expect to hold that, wet, that record for very long. In fact, 10 years. We've also done the DG200, which is a particular high performance glider. So, okay, there's a lot of hanging fruit, that's one. Any of these ones that say no claim, um, uh, well, obviously, there's 1250 or 1500 kilometres as a fair distance on a 15 metre glider. Um, there's a lot of up until recently, the triangle 100, 200, and 300 kilometres were substantially less than the 158 they are now. So, there's an opportunity that's gone on a little bit at the moment. Um, and if we look down, 80 metre class, um, probably for Craig. <laughs> um, some of the, uh, again, more triangle, 100 kilometres an hour, 158. That one, dead easy. And the advantage of that of um, 100 kilometre triangle, it doesn't take very long at 158 kilometres an hour to do 100 kilometres. You can try it seven, eight times in a day if you want. Oh, it didn't work that lap. Just do another lap. Oh, that didn't work. And you took five, six laps until eventually, yeah, that, that was the one that actually worked. Um, there's an article that which really got me interested in in, um, in the 100 kilometre task. It's on the internet. It's called Solving the Speed Run. And it's by um, a couple of Belgian pilots, uh, Till Schmelzer and Bert Schmelzer, Bert Senior Schmelzer, um, who were in Namibia, I think. So. They were interested in uh, breaking the speed record for 100 kilometre triangle and the mathematics behind it. So this is quite long. Because in the mathematics behind it, it really is a fantastic article. It opens your eyes not to just that, but up some other things as well. For example, it talks in there about the effects of altitude on the greedy speed to fly, which is something I never really thought about before. If, and even at the heights that we're talking about starting fairly high, but even at 10,000 feet, the indicated airspeed that you should fly at is slower than what your McCready setting should actually tell you to do. And instruments don't compensate for that. Perhaps the very latest generation do, I'm pretty sure that mine doesn't. So I picked up quite a few things from that, which is uh, really interesting to read. Um, Sorry, can, 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 can you say that again, what you said? The, the speed? Because I thought that if you flew higher, you flew faster because the indicated airspeed was faster than the... Wasn't the true airspeed thing? will be higher. Right. But um, what is not correct to say, uh, with most things, the indicated airspeed is what you fly to. So your stall speed is going to be whatever it is, 40 knots-ish, um, regardless of your height. Indicated speed. Okay, you actually going faster at high altitude. Well. Um, the, your McCready theory uh, is, uh, doesn't work at high altitude. So if you're, if you're flying in still air with a three-knot McCready and it's telling you to fly at 90 knots, which are many other reasonably high performance quite um, then you should in fact fly less than 90 knots at high altitude. And what I'm saying is the instruments don't generally take that into account. You will actually be doing true airspeed substantially faster than 90 knots. So as a consequence, are you better to start a record at 10,000 feet and finish at 7,000 feet or not? Yes. And that's part of all sorts of things that are going there. Okay. Because with, right. a, with a record, um, you're allowed a loss of height of 1,000 metres. It can be any 1,000 metres, 
feet. That's maybe as you can start at 10,000 feet and finish at 6,800 feet, and that's perfectly legitimate. Or you could start at um, 3,200 feet and finish at ground level, is also quite legitimate. But if you start at high altitude, and finish at high altitude, then you have a density height advantage. Um, which is not quite what we're talking about there in terms of accretive advantage, but there is a density altitude. The higher you fly, the less density of the air, the faster your true airspeed, and the faster you can go in the task. So there's all sorts of really fascinating things in here, and it talks about here, for the 100 kilometre triangle, um, if at a reasonable speed we, um, even in a high performance glider, the 10k per thousand feet glide is you know, kind of ballpark. And it doesn't matter what you're flying, that formula works very well. In a high performance glider, you might be doing it 110 knots or faster. A low performance glider might only do it 80 knots, which is why it always kind of works out to be about that. Um, so if you're only flying 100 kilometres, you're going to be, and you can lose 3,000 plus feet, you know, about a third of your task is actually in the glide and still if it's just in still air. Well, that's pretty damn substantial. And that's why those speeds of 195 type kilometres an hour um, are quite achievable because a third of it's just in the glide anyway. And you're going to be gliding at much faster than those sorts of speeds. Um, and then there are all sorts of factors that talk going to there about, okay, we're well, a 100 kilometre triangle. Um, okay, we already said you should start high uh, or high-ish for density altitude reasons, but where should you take your climb? Should you, say you start at 10,000 feet, should you glide down to 7,000 feet and take climb up to 10 and maybe take another climb later? Or do you go all the way down to 3 and wait for that 10, 15 knot climb to get all the way back up again? Because for 100 kilometres, you only need to climb maybe five, 6,000 feet. Um, it's only one climb, you're not going to eat up for very long, a couple of minutes. The flights they're talking about here, it's two minutes of climb time in the 100 kilometre flight. You also, particularly with a heavy ballast glider, get, get all sorts of advantages for pull ups and those sorts of things. They take that into account as well in terms of you're doing pull ups and lift on the task and advantages for that. Um, anyway, they calculated that. For the record they were trying to break, which was at 196 kilometres an hour or so, this was a Belgian record, um, they thought that they could do it easily in excess of 200. In fact, they did 205 kilometres an hour. But they went right into the mathematics of it. So, I, yeah, look it up. Um, called Solving the Speed Run. Uh, it really is a fascinating article. Um, we're working at records, aren't we? Um, and then as we get down to the standard class, of course, they're much more achievable. Um, it's only a triangle, a thousand kilometres down, 120 kilometres an hour. Um, 750 triangle at 134. Um, out and return 750 uh, is 145. Um, yeah, that's my record there. And one of the things I wanted to show you is uh, that flight on here. And we'll show you some other things. So that's the flight. That's my goal up to uh, Lindman and back. And there's a couple of aspects to that. We've talked about 145 kilometers an hour. Have a look at uh, the altitude. Here's where I started the task. And there's the finish. Um, and this is fairly typical, though. Sometimes they're a lot worse than this, but um, I can assure you, when I was at this point here, I wasn't thinking hard about actually breaking a record, I was more wondering whether I was going to make it home, right, because this was up about halfway to the Flinders Ranges somewhere, not real high above the ground, the ground here is at um, 1,000 feet, uh, no, uh, 2,000 feet, and I'm just over three, so I'm pretty damn low on a 14,000 foot duck, okay, um, and that's fairly typical. The other thing I want to point out with this flight um, is, uh, actually no, before I do that, I'll show you the speeds. So this shows the speed. Um, so um, from the start to Blumen was 118.99 kilometers an hour. I can assure you that's not record speed. But don't get too demoralized because you have a look at the next leg is 186.76 kilometers an hour. Right, so that's a distance of um, 376 kilometers at 186 kilometers an hour. So that's a substantial distance. And that's typical. Uh, particularly if you're pushing, as you would generally be in South Australia, if to say you're doing an outward journey, pushing into a headwind, 
that's one aspect. The other aspect is, as you saw later in that flight, I spent a lot of time cruising at around about 12 to 14,000 feet. Uh, there was a good hour in there where I basically didn't thermal. I was heading downwind, cruising at 13,000 feet. Uh, I can assure you, your ground speed is fantastic. You, know, you just look at the ground speed and it says you know, 230 kilometres an hour, and it does that for like half an hour straight. And I think, yeah, I've just done a lot of distance there. So. Um, the other thing I want to point out is the start point. Now, I remember I was flying out of Gaul here. The start point is Angston, Northern Gaul. So you can pick, this is a 750 out in return flight. Um, if your home airfield, which Gaul is not necessarily the best place to start from, uh, is uh, not uh, brilliant, or there are airspace limitations, or whatever else that may be, you can start from somewhere else. Of course, you have to finish there as well, because over the closed course. So in this particular case, I decided my best bet is to fly from Gawler out to Anderston, wait until the uh, conditions seem right. It wasn't really that long, but basically I wanted some cues and things that seemed to be lining up, um, uh, and then go for it. Um, and uh, in this particular case, I was limited by airspace there, so I had to start by 8,000 feet, so I couldn't start at 10,000, so I was still limited. Uh, but even then, it didn't particularly go well to plan. But uh, we can imagine if you've got a 100 kilometre triangle, you can wait an hour and a half until all the queues line up beautifully um, and then go for it. And that's why the speeds of um, you know, high speeds are, are achievable. Can anybody guess what the world record for 100 kilometre triangle is? Well, it was, wasn't right, yeah. It was only 94, it was in go for a long time. A long time, yeah. It's 289 kilometres an hour, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm saying, yeah, world records are out there, they simply really are out there. Um, so that's some of the considerations, and I'll get back to the whiteboard in a minute in terms of actually thinking about um, um, some of the things we think about you doing, and one of them we actually can start from. Uh, right, we're going through records. I want to point out low-hanging fruit, and there are some real low-hanging fruit. Ignoring world class, because nobody cares about world class. It's been abolished. It's been abolished. These are 20 metre class. Right. So, if you were flying in a competition these days, remember these, these are records. These are unhandicapped. And he had an Arcus. Um, it's easy. But you have look at these records here. Minimum first climb, free out and return distance. 800 kilometres? Well, the DG1000, the Jugo Discus, DG505, maybe not a K21, but anyway, any, any of those others, half reasonable, unflat, 20 metre two-seaters, mm. that should be easy. Um, so there's a whole bunch here at about 800 kilometres. I suspect what's probably going to happen, so I expected it to happen last summer, and it didn't. It'll probably happen this summer, is that somebody's going to go into a 1,000 k flight in a 20 metre glider, and then all these will go jump up to, to 1,000 kilometres. But at the moment, they're still at the 800 kilometre mark. Um, and return 300 kilometres is only 138 kilometres an hour, that's not real fast. Uh, and return 750, 104 kilometres an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you want low hanging fruit, there it is. Um, that is. What is the minimum first plane mean? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so that we don't, 20 metre was a new category a few years ago, which is why there's hardly any claims there. What we didn't want, or the GFO Sports Committee didn't want, was people putting the frivolous claims in. Okay, I've just done um, 150 kilometres in my DG1000 and go for all the rigmarole of getting a record for that. It's just silly. Mm -hmm. um, so they came up with kind of reasonable minimums. Now, I don't know what the 800 was actually based on. Do you happen to know? I can't remember. Honestly, I can't remember. There was some evidence behind it. Yeah, it came up with it. It's been based on the old two-seater records. There was a two-seater uh, category before. Could be. It would be something. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like done in mostly like Queen Estes and mm. that sort of stuff like that. Uh, I know like Hayden Dunn had one for a long time in the 300k triangle or something like that. So mm. that would probably relate to I, I something like that. I think it might have been a percentage of the open class or something. I know Pam yeah. made it up, I can't remember the details. Well, for some of the other ones, um, like the 80 meter records, I think there's, a, there's some there that haven't been claimed yet and there's a minimum first claim. Um, there it's because they've added a new record type, even though 80 meter records have been there for a long time. Um, they've added a new record type, but, um, yeah. That's based on the OCR one, I think it's 75% of the OCR one. Yeah. There's kind of a story there, I'm not actually sure what the answer is, but... Yeah, no, um, I think it's 75% of the OCR one. One of the reasons that they're doing that is because they don't want to put the 
Uh, so minimum amount return distance. So that's 1,000.86 kilometres. Well, it would be silly having an amount return distance that's less than some of the records that already exist, for example. But the amount return distance is a, um, it's a new claim. Nobody's ever claimed it. Um, that's in standard class. I mean, I've done more than 1,000 kilometres in standard class out in return, but that record didn't exist when I did it, so therefore I couldn't claim it. So they've actually put it in on that. Right, so there are the national records. Um, if you go back to... Uh, the GPO website, and right down the bottom here is Commental Records. Right, and this has... Um, well, it has all world records and all continental records in there. Um, so I'll pick a recent one. We're actually in, so for example, that 289 kilometres now is in here. We're in Oceania, so that's the Australian and broader region that is, includes Australia. Uh, if you go to something like pre-triangle distance and search for the records there, it should come up and say, no records found. Um, so in this particular, this is the continental record that, I, that I've got, which was a thousand and ninety-five kilometres. Um, the point is that if you click on that, it will give you more information on it. Now a lot of these flights have been able to see anyway, particularly um, not the recent ones. But if you want to have a look at somebody's performance, you can actually click on that, and it'll pop up with some details as to who did it, where it was from. This one happened to be out of Wakery. Um, and then this document's here is in fact the flight trace. So if I click on that, okay, well it's, it doesn't open it in CU, but anyway, that, that's the flight record from that particular flight. So you can look at anybody's records that are in there. Um, the older ones, um, it's just a broken link, but any <coughs> recent will actually be in there. Um, so that's the uh, continental record. So if we go to like a world record, and they don't have 18 metre, do they? They have to stand 15 and over. Yeah, so the categories of records are a little bit different, different to Australian yeah. records here in terms of categories of providers and also what's actually available. Uh, so I was talking about what, the speed over a triangle course of 100 kilometres. There we go. This is a world record, open class gliders. There we go, 289.4 kilometres an hour. <laughs> Um, now that's obviously in Wade, and um, it'll tell you, if you click on this, it'll tell you where it was. And there is an IGC mailing list from Cyber Turner. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they'll, they email this out, don't they? The IGC will, if you join the mailing list. Yeah, as those new records. Yeah, yeah. as new records come. So. Right, so that gives you an idea of the sorts of things to, to go for. Um, you can't just go out and fly, you've actually got to pick something to aim for. Um, there's your own personal knowledge and your flying skills. Right, so knowledge of the weather patterns, uh, your flying. Obviously you've got to be fairly reasonable pilots to contemplate um, some of these sorts of records. But you know, they're not, not unachievable. Um, you need to think about the fact that if you're doing a big flight, particularly the longer distance flights, out of uh, you know, any of the major sites in South Australia, uh, and particularly the people that are flying out of Alice Springs, because anybody will be watching this afterwards, you're going to be flying over some pretty direct remote terrain. So what are some of the considerations if you're flying out at Maree, for example? Um, which is a long way from anyway. Well, the water's the first thing. Yeah, so you've got to, you've got to have water, accessible water to you. It's a long flight anyway. How about some inaccessible water? So if you do actually outland and you've got some water, we're probably going to be flying water ballast. So what Andrew was saying, dump up all your ballast. Right? It's going to make almost no difference to your landing. Uh, if you've got 10 litres or something of water left in your wings, aren't going to make an awful lot big difference to how long you're going to sort of have out there. Um, so it is a really remote area. Um, uh, mobile phones won't work. Um, it used to be a, um, what used to be called a designated remote area, and I don't think that actually exists anymore in, in, in some ways it used to. 
Um, we used to be a requirement for an ECO in those areas. I carry uh, not an ECO, but a, um, a spot tracker. So I've got satellite based communication for something that really well. Um, know your main spots, know where the civilization is. If you do land in the middle of nowhere and you're not quite close to a, a road or something, you have to turn very close by, stay by the glider. It's a lot easier for the search for people to actually find the glider than you wandering out in the middle of nowhere. Stay with the aircraft. Um, if it does come to our landing, you better have a friendly crew. <laughs> Some of my big flights out to the north, I um, discussed this with Andy, who was my crew. Um, what would happen if I outlanded at Lee Creek, for example, or something like that? It's going to take, you know, the retrieve isn't going to happen that day. So you're going to have to find some accommodation overnight or sleep with a glider or something like that. Most likely the retrieve is going to be 24 hours plus by the time you actually get something out there. So keep that in mind, you're going to need a willing crew. Um, your, this, we're talking records here, the official observer that you need. Obviously, you need an official observer for um, your record, should you achieve it. If you are going for a, it's just a continental record, isn't it? So any normal official, official observer is fine for an Australian national record. If you want to get a world for a continental record, you need a higher uh, class of official observer that is rated to actually officiate those records. Randy is one of those, and there's a handful of them around. There's a list, yeah, there's a list on the GFA website of um, those that can do records. Under the, the sports documents is a list. Um, so with the task, I've already talked about, um, we've looked at the, some of the, the different types of tasks that are available, um, and uh, the remoteness and the landing options, so you need to keep that in mind. I've got a database of landable fields, uh, which spans northern South Australia, so it goes all the way up to um, Maori, more or less. Um, it covers all of the terrain north of Wakery, so I could head from pretty well from Murray just straight to Proven Hill if I've proven up, for example, and I've got landing options all through there uh, in the remote territory. And if you're going to fly up there, you really need that. Even if you're doing a big flight out of, say, a thousand k triangle or something out of Wakery, you're going to have to contend with, um, and say, going down into Victoria or New South Victoria, New South Wales, which you generally do. You're still going to be flying over some. Uh, large areas of unlane, uh, large unlandable areas that you're just going to have to be aware of and take to account with your terms. Um, so think about your start and your finish. We've already talked about that's supposed to say finish by the way. We've already talked about the fact that you're allowed to lose a thousand meters, so um, over 3,000 feet from the start and finish. We already talked about the fact that that start and finish may be remote. If you're doing 100 kilometer triangle, it's almost certainly going to remain remote. You're going to go to wherever the best conditions are and do a little triangle up there and come back in. Um, uh, your observation zones, so the observation zone is the area you've got to fly in to, to be deemed to a completed new flight. Um, for the start, uh, it is, uh, it's fixed. It's a line of one kilometer length. So half a kilometre either side of the centre point. Right, so you've got a line here, 500 metres each side. Finish line is the same. That isn't very big if you're slightly out of alignment, as I've discovered. When you've got a tailwind, you're coming back to a, you know, it's a kilometre from there, you know, I'm sure you can't miss a kilometre. When you're doing 280 kilometres an hour there and you're slightly out of alignment and you're approaching this and you've about finished the task and you realise you're actually heading for this edge of it to in the last 20 seconds trying to adjust your flight to go over the line properly <laughs> take some manoeuvring I only just managed it in one of the records there because what I hadn't realised was that the, uh, my instruments were navigating me to the closest point on the line which happened to be the end of it and I was heading in here thinking oh shit, about 300 metres short of the line and I'm doing close to 300 kilometres an hour Oh, you missed the line. You missed that line, you've got to turn around and come back and cross it because you've got to cross that line. To do that would have taken another couple of minutes and there goes the record. So you've got to be aware of some of the limitations. So start and finish line is a line. At start and finish is a line. Um, for your turn point, say this was a triangle with a line, flying up there, over here and back again. You can post declare what your observation zone is on these points here. 
circle the sector, 45 degrees, and 90 degree sector, 45 degrees either side of the bisector. Um, so I should explain that for people that may not be aware. Um, you've got to prove that you've gone behind that point. So if you actually draw the bisector between the inbound and the outbound leg, right, go back here, and then it's 45 degrees either side of that. So you've got a 90 degree sector. So as long as you fly anywhere in the sector behind the turn point, the team could fly around the turn point. So it flies out here. If you do that, you're given the distance from the center of your start to that point, to that point, to that point. Or you could post a clear certain 500 meters radius. If you do that, uh, that's perfectly acceptable, which means you could actually fly in here slightly short, clip that 500 meter circle in here, clip the circle, and come home again. But if you do that, you've cut it a little bit short here, and you lose uh, one kilometer, mm. one kilometer off your distance. Mm. So if this was a, um, a thousand and one kilometer task, and you do that, you've lost a kilometer there, a kilometer there, and unfortunately, your 999 kilometer speed record doesn't really count for very much. Um, yeah, we talk about start altitude as well. Um, preferably start high, and it works better. Timing of your flight is another one. Um, in particular, um, think about Particularly if it's going to be a flight that's going to take a thousand kilometres or something like or even a 750 with a remote start, it's going to take you a lot of the day to do that. So I've always got a, some idea of where I need to be on the task at various times of the day. So I know that if I'm doing this task here that I need to be up here by um, no later than uh, you know, 1300. So, so I know that if I arrive at that point and it's 13.20, I might not abandon the task yet, but I'm thinking, well, I'm going to have to pick up some speed. I'm just not going to, not going to finish before the day dies or sunset. So you have to keep some eye on, you know, some, some idea of that. If you arrive there at 12.30, fantastic. Mm. If you arrive there at 14.00, well, perhaps it's time to think about shortening your task. It's pointless. Um, when your instruments are telling you as you're heading down this way here that you're going to arrive home after sunset, you know, it's your point. But um, there's a good reason not to finish after sunset, isn't it? The well, that's another point. We yeah. can't finish legally, we can't fly after sunset, and anything that you do on this flight that is illegal will be picked up and will be available. I think, is it civil twilight? I think they have to worry about, isn't it? Yeah. There's different sorts of sunsets, but the one they worry about is the civil twilight. Mm. Right, so we've done all this task planning and whatever. Um, well in advance, this is weeks in advance. You pick a task or perhaps a couple of tasks, like the target section when you go and, have a, you go and attack. Um, you then watch the weather, waiting for the day. And you watch the weather waiting for the day, and you keep watching the weather waiting for the day, and you might wait until the following year, perhaps the year after. <laughs> uh, the, day, the really good days where you can do these sorts of flights are fairly rare. I'm not sure what they were in the last summer. Not even one or two, but I missed them all. Um, just be patient. It'll come eventually. Um, and the same applies on the day. You may think, yeah, this is the day. You know, all the models are showing that the weather's been, it's going to be fantastic. It's really going to happen. And you arrive out on the grid and the temperature's about three degrees less than it's supposed to be, and it's a cool breeze flying in, and the fuse haven't formed yet. And you're going, oh, no, 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 maybe it's not done. Or even then, you get into the air, you start your task, as I've done many times, get back to your twin pillars in the competition. <laughs> My first 1,000k attempt, I started at Gawler at I've got a tail of 3,500 feet, so straight off my task. I'm out of the tempers, <laughs> which is 14 kilometres. <laughs> <laughs> this is after we moved house, wasn't it? I remember that. Mm. Um, <laughs> 14 <laughs> kilometres from a 3,000 foot height. Okay, I had a headwind. That's, but yeah, it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's part of it. And part of the problem is, um, if I go back to see you here and show you 1,000 k out in the turn flight, one of these. Yeah. One, no, that's a very good flight. That one. So that's a thousand k at return flight. Um, it goes up to uh, Wolperina, I think. So uh, Marla's just about, uh, sorry, Marie's just about here. So it's, it goes a hell of a long way more. On that one. Just now return along the water. Was a trough line. Uh, but have a look at the start of the flight. <laughs> very typical. 
So, um, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> Quite often you want to do a really big thousand k flight and you end up doing that. If you have the option, doing this messy bit at the beginning here where you're really not making enough speed, uh, try to do that heading down. It doesn't work out at all because you're going to be doing it and you're going to be doing it more. But um, if you can do the first bit down there, then in those weaker conditions you're drifting off with the wind. Um, but you can see here I started the task at um, about 4,700 feet, which means I needed to, I couldn't finish at Brandon, finish at whatever, 1,500 feet, something like that on this flight, which um, looks like I did more or less. Um, and this was a record, so it must have been, the heights must have actually worked out for this. Um, went through the start line and went down, 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 down to I don't know, 700 feet, something like that. And remember that this is a this is a big day, so that's sticking off day, fully ballasted, 700 feet, not real far from where you started. Expect that sort of thing. It's part of the it's part fun. of the terrain. Part of the yeah, fun. It's part of the fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, the fun is here. <laughs> you have the odd deviation down here. Um, yeah, this deviation here was in, was around Lee Creek. <laughs> so okay, I'm not super low, but to be at 4,000 feet on a 14,000 foot day at Lee Creek is a long way from home. When so, you first yeah. fitted our one day, wasn't it? Day or a so feet just away? just be aware that um, this is fairly fairly typical. There is if you're doing a big flight and you're going to start like immediately, um, say you're taking an aerotow, there is a question: how high an aerotow do you actually take? Um, it's expensive up here if you take an aerotow right up there. Uh, but if you do start very high, then you have to finish high as well. So don't necessarily gain very much. Quite often there's a there's a there's a, a judgment call. There's a judgment call as to when to take the launch. Because quite likely you're actually taking the launch before the day has started. In the assumption that in the next 20 minutes before you need it, the day starts up. And that's what happened on this day here. So I've gone through start line here, and this is all just in smooth air. Okay, obviously got a bit of a climb here all the way down here, the day really hadn't started. And I was just hoping that that day would actually start up and get going, which it did eventually, but it took the time back to it. So there's, there's a whole bunch of, um, I'm not there, but there's a whole bunch of kind of decisions about what height to take, watch to take, um, uh, when, when to actually launch. If you're going for a flight that's using the maximum of the day. So these are the long distance flights. If you're out there and trying to go for a 300 km triangle record, that doesn't matter. Take off the button, you don't know, and it's not an issue. It's not going to take you very long to do that, that sort of distance. Right, so, so we're on the day, we've picked what, we've got a task, we've picked what time we're going to take a launch, um, arranged uh, your uh, most likely aero tow, potentially um, winch launch. Um, you can leave a declaration. Make sure you get your declaration right. That's another gotcha. A lot of people get the declaration wrong, wrong names in the logo, all those sorts of things. There is a bit of leeway with your number of badge flights with having some of the details wrong in your logo. There is no leeway in anything with the record. Uh, everything has to be exactly perfect. Uh, so you've got to have the right names in the logo. It's got to have uh, the right task in it, and everything's just got to be absolutely perfect. Um, it's very easy to screw that up. I suggest that you practice doing that on flights that don't matter. Download the logger afterwards and check did it actually have on it what you expected to be on. Um, the easy bit of all of this, hopefully, you're actually doing the flight. As you can see, there's a lot, of, a lot that goes into all the preparation. It's, it's all about being in the right place at the right time. You're good pilots, or you wouldn't be attempting this in the first place. So it really is all in the preparation in terms of doing this. So you've done your task. I should point out that maybe only, for me, one in five attempted record flights is actually successful. It's pretty rare. But that's OK. You just keep going at it. But assuming that you think you've achieved the record, I've thought I've achieved the record and haven't done some occasions. Uh, so you come down, you land, you say, yay, you think I've got a record, have a beer, uh, download your trace in the presence of the official observer, because you've got to do that, 
Special Observer present, and then check for technical errors, check for legal errors like last light, airspace. Um, does anybody know in the CU how you actually check for airspace? There's the airspace, airspace graph you can bring up there, which will, if you've got the right airspace actually. Yeah, so if you've got the airspace loaded into, you can use three more red lines as appropriate. Right, so this has got the airspace loaded into it, which is what all these circles and things are down here. Now this is a day where the, um, I can't remember exactly what the airspace was, I've got it selected at the moment, this is just showing the CTO steps, not the restricted airspace. Um, we would have had a clearance into that restricted airspace anyway. Um, if you uh, just go to, I don't know, what view, and some menus as well, but if you do control I, it will tell you where you have crossed airspace boundaries. Right, so in this particular case, it says I've entered the airspace at 5,221 feet and left at 4,491 feet, and it should show up in red on here as to where that was. And, and that's at 10.44, so it's, it's just in here somewhere. Okay, so this was a record, so obviously I didn't break airspace, so there would have been a goal of airspace for this that I don't enjoy to do that. Right, but um, it would be, really bad form to submit a trace for uh, uh, validation of the record and they say but hang on we're in restricted airspace so we're in controlled airspace right? that will really validate you and of course it's also an instant to do that um, check your uh, so check that you've actually leaving and done your flight check what your performance is in terms of the speed and then obviously compare it to the original record you have to beat it by one kilometer an hour for speed and I think it's, um, we have to beat the previous distance, and it might be about one kilometer. Well, half percent, is that it? No, I think it's an absolute. Is it three percent? Yeah. Um, okay, so we've finished the flight, we've got, <coughs> um, we've got our record, downloaded the trace. The first thing you need to do is submit um, an initial notification of the record. If you miss that step, you will not get the record. So you've got to do the initial notification, that's pretty easy to do. There's an online form on the GFA website. Do you know where it is? Okay. Probably find it. No, I won't do it just now, but anyway, <laughs> if, if it is on the GFA website somewhere in the records area, there's an initial, just a form you fill out there. Um, very simple details saying, hey, yeah, I think I did a thousand kilometres, I put them either here or on this day. This person's got an official do it. That's about it. Um, and then you have to follow up with all the formal paperwork, and as many uh, can attest to. For an Australian record, it's not too bad. It's a bit onerous. For a world or continental record, it's months and months, six months or something. Oh. That, that continental record that, that I went for was just horrendous. Um, I'm glad the man who's doing the paperwork. But I'm not trying to put you off to any records, but there is it's a paperwork. There's just this huge amount of paper. <laughs> and they're so old fashioned, you've got to send them, and it's, they're two SD cards. So you can't email to them, you can't. You've got to send them two physical SD cards. Friends. And it was 200 euros, 250 euros or something in the mm. process as well, so there was, there was costs associated. But anyway, so that's kind of our records. The Australian <laughs> records are $10 or something like that to apply for them and much less paperwork. So please do, please go have a go at it. Um, oh, it's getting fairly late. I reckon I should stop talking. Any questions? But, um, um, Caliban Calibration of uh, logins out to the particular What's the. Can you explain that? What's your point of the uh, Just a normal logger calibration. Mm -hmm. yeah, aren't you meant to have them calibrated on a period of It's for records? It's changed, yeah. How it's five years? It was every two years, but they don't. They never change. No, it was good. every two years for flying and world championships and things like that. But didn't so that everything's changed to five years. Mm -hmm. so everything. Yeah. yeah, anything. So if you have a reason new, longer then yes, but it's inside five years anyway. If it's older than that, then you're getting calibrated. Which these days is almost getting out. Almost, almost as expensive to get one calibrated as cost of one new log. They're developing that fast, much get a new logger anyway. Well, just about. By the time five years has gone, we all loggers are... I mean, it was it last year, year before last, when there was a problem with the, G, the Garmin, the older Garmin GPS engines, which invalidated a lot of loggers. At that time, I had two Vox loggers and an old Cambridge 302. 
Um, it forced me to get rid of them, which is great, because <laughs> they're crappy old things. I got those box loggers in 1999 or something like that, but I was still using it because it still worked yeah. until it stopped working. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? In my collar bar, I've got probably 1999 still working, still using it. <laughs> I don't know whether it be suitable for record finance, okay, for badges and stuff. If, if you're not sure, the uh, FAI page um, actually has the list of loggers and what they're actually certified mm -hmm. to do with them. Some of them badges only. Mm -hmm. And yes, the older ones, they're gradually, because the security is poor, mm -hmm. they're gradually dropping them off the list, but they'll drop it off from records first um, and then you put them down. Mm -hmm. And that links on the GFI page, that page of yeah. patients, the link for certified loggers or approved loggers, whatever they're called. I had a look in there and I couldn't figure it out. It's better than they're not. Yeah. No idea. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, you know, I think the older versions have dropped off. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. I probably think that they've been using it anymore. There's a lot of people with old loggers there. What do you do with the, uh, well, what's the steps with the official observer? You have to see certain things. And up landing as well, as well as stuff. One or the other. Yeah. So they've got to be there when the logger, see if they take off the main or something, the logger's put in the glider, or taken out of the light, so they've got to be one end of the light. Um, and they've got to be there when the trace is actually downloaded, so they can, um, you know, they can't download some other trace and substitute. I mean, it shouldn't be possible to cheat anyway, because there's you know, security built into the loggers. Um, I guess, theoretically, you could actually put a declaration in the logger, get somebody else to fly it, and then claim a PW5 more record. <laughs> the narrow mind will come said if Patrick guy who was running across the finish line holding his logger. That was very sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you actually got to fly it. You don't to walk around the task. You run around and the task. Him. <laughs> he's this close and he just shoved him and ran across the line holding his logger. <laughs> no question. <laughs> you got to try, don't you? 500 points and walk off. You got to try. If you land 10 metres short yeah. of the finish point, you can always throw the log. Yeah. <laughs> so it has been tried. <laughs> Fly it on a simulator, <laughs> an MEA output to your logger. Mm. All right. Thank you, Ashley.